Welcome to the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. It's always our pleasure to have you in the midst of us. And of course, we want to invite you to come out to worship with us on Sunday mornings as we meet every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Time in the parking lot of the Henry Street Church of Christ building. Uh, we're located at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gaston, Alabama, USA. 35901 is our zip code. And so, of course, we are still in a pandemic. Uh, many of us in the United States, many of us have been vaccinated against the coronavirus. But, of course, we're uh, still a long way to go in that process in the United States and Try to eradicate the coronavirus as much as humanly possible, or at least have the resistance in order to, you know, resume normal life. So we're trying to do as much normal life as possible when it comes to worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so we still maintain the assembly according to the word of God that requires us to do so, but not only requires us to do so, we're happy to do as well as we get a chance to fellowship with each other, but most of all, to give God the praise, glory, and honor that he rightly deserves. So you're welcome to uh, come out and worship with us. Uh, we do worship in our parking lot, and that way we uh, all stay in our vehicles, and we have the technology where we just have a small handful of brothers that stand outside and uh, orchestrate the service while the uh, rest of the membership are in the vehicles listening through the radios as we have the technology to submit through an FM's channel uh, during the time of the worship service. If not, uh, be able to just roll your windows down in here and be able to have a good time in the Lord, but most of all to honor him the way he deserves because he's done everything for us, especially giving us Jesus who suffered, died, and rose again that we may have a chance at eternal life. So we look forward to having you. You'll be honored guests again, 9 a.m. Central Time at the Henry Street Church of Christ on Sundays. And as you know, we're meeting here at the same time every Wednesday virtually uh, for Bible class. Of course, we're going through uh, the Gospel of John. We take a book at a time and we study it verse by verse in order to get the true thought of God. And, how, and then we, from there, we uh, apply it to our lives. We're not just trying to learn academic things. We're trying to learn the Word of God and as well as believe it and be able to live it as well as share it with other people. So we're on the Gospel of John. We've been on it for several weeks now. We're on week number 23, and we're going through the topic of the Jewish people reject the bread from heaven. So again, our main thought tonight in study is the Jewish people reject the bread from heaven. Now, of course, on your screen, you'll see where I want to take a short intermission before getting into the lesson tonight uh, to introduce and reintroduce our YouTube channel. The easiest way to get there is just go to youtube.com and type in my name, Anthony L. Norwood. You can also use the words Henry Street Church of Christ and also find us. But you want to seek out my picture and the name Jesus is Lord is what I'm called on YouTube. And we have hundreds of videos. We've actually been doing videos since 2016. And we do have those organized for your convenience and to make sure it's easy for you to share them with others. So we have them categorized in what YouTube calls uh, playlists. And so I think we have at least 16 or 17 or so playlists that have different topics for you to choose from. Uh, one of them, of course, is the uh, topic at hand, the Gospel of John. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we're in uh, part number 23. In other words, the 23rd week of going through that, that book of the Bible, that great, wonderful work of God. And if you want uh, lessons 1 to 22, you can go there. And we always take these Facebook Live sessions and we uh, place them on YouTube within 24 hours. And that way you can grow at your own pace, study as much as you want. And then explore various topics uh, within the Word of God itself. Like, for instance, we do have uh, topics regarding comfort. You know, if you need to pick me up, you know, emotional upliftment and to know that God is there. We've got so many messages on that. Social issues, what's going on in the world and how they impact the Lord's church, how they impact our everyday lives, etc. And how to deal with these things, these practical things we have under the category of social issues. Sound doctrine is the fundamentals of, of the Christian faith. 
you know, exactly how we are to live, etc., is there. Uh, we do have a section on Christian living, uh, which goes even further and more advanced in sound doctrine. Uh, Christian salvation, Bible characters, some of the more advanced topics like the afterlife, second coming, etc. So I encourage you to visit that YouTube uh, page of ours that's dedicated to the glory of God. Subscribe uh, to the channel as well as like and share the video so that we can uh, reach the world with the word, word of truth. We've got a lot of things to combat a lot of the false doctrine out there and other things to reach those that don't know Christ at all. We call them the unchurched that have not been introduced to Christ at all. So this can help you in your own personal ministries and reaching your family and friends. I look at it as a mini library of uh, biblical topics that we can use for our own personal uh, gain to be stronger in Christ as well as to convert others and strengthen the other members of the Lord's Church worldwide. I want to thank um, many of our brothers that support our broadcast around the world, of course, across the United States, but also internationally uh, on the, in the continent of Africa, especially in our uh, uh, brothers in Nigeria, Uganda, and Malawi. We add them to the list as well. Our, our brethren in the Caribbean, in Jamaica and St. Vincent especially, and of course, our brothers in the Asian and uh, Asian subcontinent being, of course, uh, India, Pakistan, the Philippines, and uh, of course, in Europe, the island nation of Malta. So we thank you for all uh, joining us and the support you give us over the years, the moral support that is of being with us, worshiping fellowship with us here in this virtual uh, format on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. But let's get into the word of God in and of itself. And take home from uh, with us that which will inspire us, make us stronger, and that we can share with others. Uh, we're in John chapter number 6 as we're proceeding throughout the entire chapter and of course the book of this book of the Bible as our ultimate goal. Uh, let's read together John chapter 6 verse 41 to 43 which is on your screen or however you want to follow along your paper Bible or your electronic device such as a Bible app, whatever it may take. Let's go to the Word of God. Now, I'm going to be reading directly from the King James Version of the Holy Word of God. And again, we're John 6, 41 to 45. Again, we read all the way through because we want to know God's overall thought. And then we go back verse by verse to get the details after that. That way we don't make any mistakes in our Bible interpretations. In other words, we're doing our due diligence to make sure we understand God's Word and understand it properly for application unto our lives. All right, verse uh, 41 through 45 reads again in the Gospel of John according to the Gospel of John, that is, verse number 6. Uh, the Bible says, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. Verse 44 and 45 says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. For it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So again, that was a reading of John chapter 6, verse 41 to 45. Now let's go more in depth now in reversing and going back to verse 41 to 42. And it says, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Now this Jewish audience that was listening directly to Jesus at the time was obviously upset because Jesus was rightfully telling them he was the bread from heaven, as we discussed on last occasion. So this means that his audience was offended by Jesus, telling him of his divine nature and true origin. They obviously did not believe he was and is the Son of God, because they were familiar with his earthly family, according to John 6, verse 41 and 42. Now, of course, this teaches us. That it's often difficult 
to share our Christian conversion with those who know us. In other words, when people notice that we have changed, they don't always believe that we have changed. See, Christians today often receive this type of unbelief from our peers after we have changed our lives for the better. In other words, they can never forget who we were. And many times they want us to remain who we were when in fact God has changed us. And we're thinking to ourselves, we're not going back to the old man, the old man of sin that God would disapprove of. However, they want to bring us back into that through our their uh, 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 influence, I should say, of negative influence. So many times they degrade us, they call us out of our names, they persecute us, whatever the case may be. So when our families and our peers know we have become Christians, are trying to live righteously, they often do not believe that our change is genuine. They don't believe that it's authentic. But at the same time, we don't have to worry about that. See, our peers know our pre-Christian background. However we, sh however, we should never let anyone discourage us for continue our Christian walk of faith and doing the right thing. See, when we are reborn in Christ, we are a new creation in God's sight. According to, uh, according to John chapter 3, verse 2 to verse 8, that we, we already read in time gone by. But also, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and Galatians 3 verse 27 show us that we are a new creation, that God sees us as an entirely different person after we become a Christian, and how that comes to being. All right, let's look at that for a moment. And let's decipher what God is saying, and we'll come back to John chapter number 6. So when you look at 2 Corinthians 5 verse number 17, for instance, the Bible says this about us as Christians. It says, therefore... If any man be in Christ, now keep that under your belt. In other words, remember the words in Christ because God's word is going to describe how to get there, how to be in Christ. But going back to 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Notice he said all things have become new. So that means our status as sinners, is no longer the same. We have become a new creature, creation, which means that now we're saints in God's eyes, also known as forgiven children of God, also known as Christians. So because, because that's part of the all things, right? Uh, we become unfavored to favor. In other words, we have the grace of God in our lives. We have a new status with God. We could become, we come from the status of enemy to friend of God, one at peace with him after we're in Christ. And so when you further traverse the Bible, in other words, when you go to other scriptures, like Galatians 3 verse 27, it shows us how that comes to being. In other words, how we become a person that's into Christ. Because, because the Bible says in Galatians 3 verse 27, For as many of you as been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, which means you become one with him. All right? In God's sight. Okay, so for as many of you as been baptized, that means to go through the water of baptism, according to the commandment of Jesus that said in Mark 16, verse number 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. So again, Galatians 3, 27 says, for as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Okay, all right. So again, when we are reborn into Christ, that means when we become Christians, we are a new creation in God's sight. Again, according to your references of Galatians, excuse me, of John chapter 3, verse 2 to verse number 8 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, along with Galatians 3, verse number 27. Now, one thing we got to keep in mind that keeps us encouraged and keeps us faithful to the commitment we made of becoming Christians is to remember this. It's the opinion of, opinion of God and not the opinion of mankind that counts. So I know this is a hard thing to accept and, and to be able to say to you, but, you know, if you're a Christian and you know you're a blood-bought Christian, you're forgiven of your sins, you're living a Christian life, and your mother does not accept it, you cannot go by your mother's opinion. You have to go by what God says about you. Same thing applies to your father, your brother, your best friend of 30 years, whoever it may be, strangers. They can doubt all they want, but when God puts his stamp of approval on you, symbolically speaking, that's all that you need. 
And that's all the approval that you need. Yes, you'll go through some emotional things. To be rejected by family and friends, peers, and even strangers can be hurtful at times. But at the end of the day, remember the joy you're laboring for. Remember Revelation 21 verse number 4, which is what we're going to receive when we make it to heaven. Where the Bible says there'll be no more crying, dying, pain, no sorrow. God's going to wipe away all tears. From the saints eyes. So no matter what persecution. Whatever we have to lose down here. Whatever we sacrifice. It's going to be more than paid back. Uh, by the Lord. In the eternal life stage that we have. And the home in heaven. That's awaiting for all of us. Which Jesus said in John 14. Verse 1 and verse number 2. He said let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house and many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place. For you. So Christian community out here. Continue to claim who you are. And do not conform to the criticism of others. Let them not discourage you. Their criticism will never keep you out of heaven. If you stay faithful to Jesus unto death. According to Revelation 2 verse number 10. Now moving on. To verse 43 and verse number 44. The word of God says. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them. Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now in these two verses, let's look at them for a moment. Here we see Jesus commanding the crowd not to murmur among themselves. That's nothing but you know a public complaint section, session among themselves. Now, Jesus is showing them that those who become his disciples are actually drawn by God himself. Again, according to John 6, verse 44 and verse number 45. Now, how is this done? How is God drawing men unto himself? Well, the answer is in the word of God. This is because all the prophets of the Old Testament, including John the Baptist in the New Testament, and even Jesus' own words came from God himself. You see, all the words of these men came from God, and they all agree that Jesus is the Messiah, also known as the Son of Almighty God. Remember, don't get confused by those terms. Messiah, Lord, Savior, Christ, Son of God, all refers to the same person. And according to Isaiah 54, verse 13, which talks about it in, in prophecy as well as the New Testament backing it up, we know that this Messiah, this Son of God, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Without him, there will be no salvation. See, if one does not believe in Jesus as the Son of God, then he or she is actually denying the testimony of God himself. In other words, remember, we studied in time gone by that the words of God, from the tongue of God, if you will, literally, he claimed Jesus as his only begotten son at Jesus' baptism at the hands of John the Baptist. And, of course, the Word of God claims it all over uh, from Genesis to Revelation and prophecy in the Old Testament in fulfillment in the New Testament that Jesus is the Son of God, our Lord and our Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords, and the judge of my, all mankind at the end of time. And, of course, some examples of that you'll see in Mark chapter 1, verse 11, and also the book of Matthew in chapter 17, verse number 5. It is God's Word. To answer the question, how is man called to salvation? It's God's word that calls men to salvation according to Romans 10, verse number 17. When you look at that scripture, it makes it very blunt. What well, the Bible says in Romans 10, verse number 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? By the word of God. Okay? So that's how men, God calls man to salvation, through the word of God. As Paul says it in sarcastic way, he says through the foolishness of preaching. Remember, it's not foolish to those that obey God's word and can accept it. It's only foolish to those that doubt it. That a man could die on the cross for our salvation and to pay the price for our sins. That's foolishness to, to the average ear. But it's power, it's truth, it's life, and it's joy to all Christians. Because we know without Jesus dying for us, there'll be absolutely no chance, zero chance of us making it unto heaven. So again, it's God's word that tells everyone that Jesus is the way to salvation and the only means of salvation for anyone in uh, this world. 
And again, examples of that, John 3, verse number 16 and 17, and Acts chapter 4, verse 12, show us that Jesus is the exclusive means and the only means for us to be saved. Now, continuing on with our study of John chapter number 6, we come to chapter uh, 6, verse 46 to verse number 48, that reads as follows according to the King James Version. And this is Jesus talking. He says, not that any man have seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Verse 49 and 51, actually, let's go all the way down in that passage of Scripture. And Jesus continued to speak in verse 49 and 51. He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is a bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, going backwards and getting the detail from what we just read. Verse 46 says, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Now, in these verses, Jesus is telling us that he is the only person who has actually seen God. How is this possible? Well, we can answer that question. This is because he is divine. He existed before the world began and mankind was created. So Jesus existed before Adam and Eve. So that is how he can see God and nobody else has ever seen him. Remember, that's why John starts off in the first chapter talking about Jesus' divine status. That book is ultra important. That chapter, in order to understand who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and the extent of his power, which is really of no limit at all. There's no, no limit on the power Jesus has. Because remember, Jesus existed in the beginning of time. And he created mankind and everything that's in the earth, including the earth itself. So that's how he saw God. Because remember John chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So that means that the Word was God, His name is Jesus, and He dwelt among us. He became flesh later on. First, He was completely spiritual along with uh, the Father God. And then He became flesh to die for us. That means He became human. So Jesus is divine. He existed with the Father long before mankind was created and is the creator of mankind. He is certainly qualified to lead us in all aspects of righteousness and save our souls since we know all these facts about him. All right, moving on to verse number 47 now. Jesus is still speaking to the unbelieving crowd. He's saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, meaning he has everlasting life. In our regular everyday English. Now Jesus tells the audience and all mankind that faith in him as the Messiah is necessary for one to be saved. In other words, we must, without exception, believe he is the Son of God in order to be saved as we talked about already. John 3, 16, John 6, verse 47, Mark 16, 15 and 16 show us explicitly, without a doubt, without a reasonable doubt, that he is the Son of God. And we must believe in him in order to be saved. You see, even if we are morally sound people in this life, without faith in Christ, we cannot be saved. Okay? A lot of people use that excuse. Well, I'm a good person, so I know I'm going to heaven. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. This is because it still takes Jesus to get us there. Nobody has lived perfect enough and never will live perfect enough. In order to uh, make it to heaven. That's what the Bible says in Romans 3 verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6 verse 23 talks about what we've earned, including myself, without Christ. It says the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So if we've earned anything, it's definitely not heaven. It's eternal misery instead. And so God is showing us that we need a lifeline. We need a savior. And he was gracious enough, loving enough, patient enough, 
in order to send his son that was sacrificed for us so that we don't have to answer for those sins and answer for that which we have earned, but instead be at peace with God and have heaven as our home when all is said and done. That's why people love to hear the words of Jesus Christ in John 3, verse number 16. That was like music in our ears, sweet music in our ears. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The golden text of the Bible, John 3, verse number 16, of course, are those golden words. Now, even if, and this is another thing we want to bring into mind, even if we are part of religious organizations and orders who claim to worship the same God as we Christians do, but do not believe in Jesus being the Son of God, they cannot be saved. There is no, it doesn't matter how much you pray, it doesn't matter how much you study so-called holy books that come out of Hinduism, Islam, that comes out of other religions, uh, they may help you be sound morally in some instances. But at the end of the day, they still have no savior because they're denying Jesus as the son of God. And without it, we don't have everlasting life that Jesus is showing us. And he's talking to the unbelievers and making them know that without him, there is no way to be at peace with God, have forgiveness of your sins, nor a heaven for us to claim as our home when all is said and done. So even more, we can do all the good deeds in this world to help others, but even that's not enough. If we do not have faith in Jesus being our Lord and Savior, we cannot be saved without exception. And Jesus is going to, going to go more into detail in that in John chapter 6, verse 48 and 49, and verse number 50, which we'll read right now again and study in detail. Uh, Jesus talks about this in John, four, uh, John chapter 6, verse 48 to 50, which reads as follows. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Now, of course, again, Jesus makes it clear that he is the bread of life in verse 48. Again, this is symbolism saying that he is the source of eternal life for mankind's souls. Furthermore, he is showing his superiority to the earthly bread received by the children of Israel known as manna, during the time of Moses, as we discussed in great detail on last occasion. Now, going to verse number 51, he says, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, again, the earthly bread during Moses' time could not give eternal life, but Jesus could then and can now. Even more, Jesus foretells his death for the salvation of mankind in verse 51. Remember, all mankind has sinned, as mentioned earlier, and earned eternal death, which is eternal punishment, according to Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. However, we are given, and I want to stress given eternal life, meaning we didn't earn it, through the death of Jesus Christ, who died as a substitute, for the punishment we earned on our own, which you'll see in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse number 2. Well, God calls Jesus in the King James Version of the propitiation for our sins. And propitiation means the sacrifice that makes atonement. Further broken down to make it simple, atonement means a peacemaking offering with God. When he died on the cross of Calvary, that made peace for us believers for us to be saved. And peace with God, of course, is what I'm referring to. All right, moving on, as we continue John chapter number 6. We've gotten down to verse 52 to verse number 54. Proud of you and giving you a pat on the back for you, hanging in there in the lesson and continuing your studies in John chapter number 6. It's well worth it and well encouraging for us to learn these words. And for those that are already Christians, it reinforces your faith. For those that are not Christian, it's showing you the grave importance of you becoming one before it's everlastingly too late uh, so that heaven can be your home as well. Uh, verse 52 to 54 in John chapter number 6 says, out of the King James Version, and we're reading all the way down to verse 58. The Bible says, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55 says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Last two verses, verse 57 and verse number 58 said, As a living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Now as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now going back to verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now the Jewish audience began arguing among themselves, is what the word strove means. They did not understand how Jesus could give his flesh to them to eat it. Now, of course, Jesus was talking in symbols. He was not going to sever, meaning to cut off pieces of his literal human flesh for them to consume. So obviously, common sense should have told him something different than what they were thinking, according to verse 52. Now, Jesus again was talking about his death on the cross as a means for their salvation. They must eat it, which means believe in his atoning sacrifice for their sins in order to be forgiven of them as we've been discussing throughout this lesson. Verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Now here Jesus goes on to tell them they must eat of his flesh and drink of his blood in order to have spiritual life. He again is showing them they must accept his death as a peacemaking offering to God and realize the fact that his shed blood is the means for their forgiveness. One of my favorite passages of scriptures and one of the most enlightening is, of course, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5, that speaks about Jesus' blood being the offering that washes away our sins, which means causes our forgiveness. It says in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5, And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, let's move on with our lesson. Continuing on with John chapter 6, verse 53. Now, the benefit of being a Christian, of course, is eternal life in the heavenly bliss. Now, these same saved people will be raised from the dead on the judgment day to come. As we're being shown in verse 54. They will be carried away into heaven with the Lord. In other words, as the old hymn goes, I'll fly away. That's definitely going to happen. That song is true because it's based on the word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, and chapter 6, verse 54 all shows us that we're going to rise from the dead one day. And those that are Christian are going to be caught up together in the clouds of the Lord to be forever with him uh, in the heavenly glory. All right, verse 55, as we continue down John chapter number 6, Jesus continues to talk about his flesh symbolically. He says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, furthermore now, Jesus shows us, Jesus is showing us then that his body and blood is food and drink for the life of the soul. Verse 55. When we spiritually partake of the flesh and blood of Jesus, which is symbolism for our faith in the Lord, we become one with him. If you notice, he said that in, in John chapter 6, verse 56. And we also studied that already in Galatians 3, verse 27, where it said those that have been baptized have been what? Baptized into Christ. So that means we become one with him in the sight of Almighty God. So again, now in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is dealing with the lack of faith in the people that he's talking to. And he's trying to show them how that's not acceptable to God and how that's not going to result in any good outcome from them for them on the judgment day. Now, thus, Jesus is mentioning not is not mentioning that is other aspects of God's plan of salvation yet. I want to show you this just for a moment to take a quick uh, intermission. What I mean by that is that people will take this verse 
and say that faith alone is all that's necessary to be saved. No, Jesus is just dealing with faith for a moment. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing necessary for salvation. You see, he's not mentioning other aspects of God's plan of salvation yet unto this audience. Why would he? Think about it. If the people would not believe, they would not obey anything else he had to say about salvation. You see, later in Bible history, the word of God will talk about more than just faith being necessary to become a part of Christ. Okay. In fact, it also reveals that water baptism is necessary for one to become one with Christ for salvation, which we've already read in Galatians 3.27. And this is why Jesus will command the following things later on in Bible history. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Uh, he goes on and not only talk about faith, he goes on to talk about baptism to the crowd as well in water. He says in Mark 16, verse 15 and verse number 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Remember, faith is what causes you to believe in someone, to put your trust in them, their confidence. But baptism is what makes you a follower of them. Remember, when you, you think about uh, the preaching to the Jewish people, baptism, even when it became uh, 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 necessary to become a Jewish convert, even before Christ was born in the earth, they were baptizing people because that meant you accepted someone's teaching and you had become their follower. That was the purpose of baptism. So when someone in, in the Jewish faith understood that somebody said you must be baptized, that's literally saying you must go down in water to become that person's follower. And that's the point of baptism. And that's why Jesus commands it because that's when you are showing that you desire to become a follower of Christ, and God makes you that once you come through the watery grave of baptism. That's why, again, Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, and number 16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So as you can see, baptism plus faith is necessary for salvation. All right, we're getting closer to closing out here, so just a few more things to discuss, and I appreciate your patience and your listening ear to the Word of God and a heart that's soaking this in, that's taking this in, and allowing it to take root in your heart. Now, the Bible says in verse 57, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now, here we see in verse 57, we see Jesus telling the world he was sent by God the Father. He will say this multiple times, many times that is, throughout his earthly ministry. Now Jesus further reveals that the Father lives. So yes, the Father God lives to this very day. He has no beginning and no ending. He always had life and always will have life in and of himself, himself that is. So Jesus further reveals that the Father lives and gives him life as well. I remember he was made flesh, a human being, so the Father gave him life. Now, in turn, Jesus gives us life, okay? So, Jesus is saying that he gives life to those, that is eternal life, heaven, to be our home, to those that follow him. Now, uh, it's even deeper than that. I'm going to explain that even more as we go along. So, remember, Jesus gave earthly, li earthly life because he rightfully created mankind, remember? Again, we talk about that in John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 3 and verse number 14, that he created the earth and everybody in it. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and verse number 3, later on in the Bible, also confirms the same teaching, that everything that was made was made by Jesus Christ. So he gave us the earthly life, the human life that we enjoy here today, but he's trying to give us even beyond that. So most importantly, he gives spiritual life on earth to those that follow him, which means he reconnects faithful mankind with the Father in a relationship of harmony one with another. As you'll see from Isaiah 59, verse 2, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 12, sin does separate us from God. So that all of us we know have sinned, as we talked about our, earlier in Romans 3, verse 23, and Romans 6, verse 23, so there's no way we can earn our own salvation by ourselves. We have to have Jesus to reconnect us with God, in other words, to make peace with God the Father, 
so that we can live with him in eternity when all is said and done. You'll see that we study this, but I'll give you as your reference point. You want to study on your own time. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, verse number 10, where the Bible shows us that we were enemies to Christ. We we're enemies to God before Christ died for us. And we shall be saved by his life, which means we'll be saved because Christ rose again. He'll come back and fulfill 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, verse number 17, where we'll meet him in the clouds to be forever with, with him in the Lord in the heavenly glory. Okay, so remember... Spiritual life and death is in God's eyes, which is whether whether or not we have a relationship with God the Father. So remember, the Bible calls those that are that are not connected with him. That means that those that don't have a peaceful relationship with God as dead. And on the other hand, he calls those that on earth while we live, those that have a connection with God the Father because we're Christians alive. So that's the difference. OK, just like in the Bible, darkness means sin and death. And light means uh, righteousness, purity, and life, okay? So it's the same thing. When you have that connection with Christ, you are in the light. When you have that connection with Christ, you have fellowship with God the Father. When you have the connection with Christ, you have peace with God the Father. And you have eternal life awaiting you on the judgment day. But when you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't believe in him, or you live in hypocrisy, you won't obey him then you're in darkness, uh, you're dead in your sins, as the Bible calls it, and you have no relation with God the Father, not, not, at least not one of peace that will uh, give you interest in the heaven when all is said and done. All right, so again, Jesus creates that relationship of peace between man and the Father God. Thus, those who have this connection with God the Father are spiritually alive, while others are spiritually dead in their sins. I like the way that Paul, uh, through God's inspiration, the Holy Spirit, phrases this, or in other words, brings us to our, ten our attention in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1, where he says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, he's talking to the Christian community at this point. Quickened in the old King James language means have been brought back to life. Okay. So Christ, that means Jesus, has brought us back to life in the sight of God the Father because before our old status were, was that we were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, rebellion from God and the sinful deeds that we have done had put us in darkness and death in God's eyes. All right, let's go to verse 58 uh, that says, and this is Jesus again that's speaking. He says, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that, eateth the, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now lastly, Jesus again reveals he is the bread from heaven. He is the one who creates and sustains spiritual life for all of God's children. We must understand that we must continue to eat the bread of life and drink of his blood our entire life. You see, our continued faith and obedience to the Lord is necessary for our salvation. You see, if we stop believing in Jesus as the Son of God, then we will lose our souls. In other words, we won't have salvation anymore, and we'll go on to eternal misery instead of eternal salvation. And you'll see that in the Hebrew writings. When you look at the book of Hebrews, especially some key chapters here that talks about continuing in the faith, continuing to believe and obey Jesus, then you'll understand that we cannot be swayed from that through anything we read through things we see on television, through persuasive arguments from non-Christians, uh, imams in Islam, um, rabbis in, in Judaism, uh, whatever the spiritual men are called that are in Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. Uh, even the Dalai Lama, who's so, so highly respected in this life, if they say anything that's contrary to the Bible, then of course you know you need to stop listening to them, which they already have done. And, of course, listen to Christ's word instead, because without him, you cannot be saved. So discard all these things, because these men are not telling the truth, because they're denying Jesus as the Son of God, which is the only way to salvation. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. So again, hold on to your faith, because it's necessary for salvation. Again, you see the Hebrew writer saying this in Hebrews 3, verse 12, and 12, number 12 and number 13, that says, Take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So again, notice when you get that unbelief that you start believing that Jesus is not the son of God and that kind of thing. 
God says that's an evil heart. Now notice, that's God passing judgment on that heart. So all those religions and all those leaders and all those that believe these things, that deny that Jesus is the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, God is saying all that comes from an evil heart. Even if they sound good, even if they sound holy, we have to understand that these are coming from evil people and many times with evil intentions. I don't have to say it. God's word is saying it. It's not me personally that we can share these things with other people. And God is showing us this. Look at this in verse number 13. This is exactly what God is saying. He says, but exhort one another daily. That means encourage each other. Every Christian encourage each other to stay in the faith while it's called day. In other words, while we still have the opportunity to do so. Remember, day is life and night is death in symbolism in God's way of saying things. He says, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's talking about false doctrine, false teachings that are out there that are trying to combat the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Lord and our Savior. Okay? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 as well. Make sure we don't skip that one also. That's just important. As important. He says, the Bible says, but be we, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. The drawback unto perdition is talking about faith. We start believing, and so we go to destruction. That means eternal punishment. Perdition is another word for destruction. And God says, but we're not those type of people. In that verse, verse 39, he says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's confession, that belief that Jesus, the Son of God, is what saves you in the end. All right, likewise, if we stop obeying the words of, words of God, he revealed to us, we also will not see heaven as our home. Of course, you'll see that Hebrews 1, verse 1 and verse number 3, everything spoken by Jesus came from God the Father, so he was speaking directly God's word. And he also says on Matthew 7, verse number 21, regarding the judgment day and how many people are not going to be saved that are going to be begging to be saved. Uh, he says, not everybody that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So hypocrisy is absolutely unacceptable. We have to truly obey God, not only believe him, but obey him to be saved. So let no one shake you from your commitment of faith and obedience to the Lord, because it will have grave consequences to the soul. So we'll end here. We won't go any further down in the chapter, John chapter number six. So again, uh, thank you for being a wonderful audience. As we're going to get into some deeper studies next week, and I want to start that uh, at this point, because it'll, it really won't do the Word of God justice in the small amount of time we have left. So your, your homework always is to uh, be like the ancient Bereans in Acts chapter number 17, as they study behind the Apostle Paul to see if these things are so. I encourage you to study behind uh, my ministry as well. And always remember that if there's a preacher that's afraid of you going back to study behind them or discourage you from doing that, he must be hiding something. So it sounds like a ministry you need to run from and run from right away. But also be, be encouraged to study ahead of me. Go to John chapter 6, starting with verse 59, on down the chapter, all the way into the next chapter, and be encouraged by the Word of God throughout the week. But again, I want to invite you back to the YouTube channel. Remember this video here on Facebook Live, uh, Lord Wills, will be posted on the YouTube channel as well. And you can easily reach us by going to YouTube.com and typing my name, Anthony L. Norwood. Uh, you'll see my name, and of course, you'll see my name on, uh, on YouTube as Jesus is Lord. You'll see the beginning pages, the home page of the channel with the last five videos or the newest videos. But also, you can go to the playlist, which is a category of videos that we have. have hundreds of, of videos and uh, 16 or 17 different topics. For you to choose from uh, that you can learn at your own pace. I encourage you to not only go to YouTube.com, but also to subscribe to the channel so that you get the notifications when the uh, videos are available unto you. When they're posted, you'll automatically get that notifications when you sign into your YouTube account. But I also encourage you to stay with us uh, and continue on Wednesday nights in these virtual broad uh, Bible study classes. Again, we meet at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time here uh, in Alabama, in the United States. But, of course, uh, you can convert that to your own time zone. And we'll be going live and wherever you are in the world. That's the beauty of technology. You can uh, reach us anywhere in the world where you have an Internet connection uh, or even a cell phone connection. 
Uh, you can get to these videos and be encouraged by them yourselves and encourage others with it. And of course, we ask you to subscribe to the channel and also to um, like the videos as well because we want to gain popularity, not for our own vain glory's sake, uh, for bragging rights, that kind of nonsense, but no, to glorify the word of God, to make sure that the world knows that Jesus is King, Lord of Lords, our head of our lives and our Savior uh, accordingly. You can help in spreading the gospel just with uh, the touch of a, bu a few buttons in order to share that. And of course, don't forget, we do meet on Sunday mornings if you're in the Northeast Alabama area uh, at the Henry Street Church of Christ parking lot service, again, to stay safe from the coronavirus uh, that's going out there. We meet at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gadsden, Alabama. 35901 is our zip code. And you can get all that address information and more information about the Henry Street Church of Christ on our website, which is located at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. And for those that are Christians, remember the plan of salvation so that you can share them. Uh, uh, the plan of salvation, that is, the verses that relate to them, to share with your family and friends for their salvation. And if you're not a member of the Lord's Church, it is, you haven't given your life to Christ for your salvation, please hear these words out because it's the most important words that you can ever hear in your life. The plan of salvation starts in Romans 10, verse number 17, where the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Uh, that word is in John 3, verse number 16, that you already heard, where the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the subject of that conversation, that verse, verse uh, 16, in John chapter number 3, is Jesus. He is that Savior that was given by the Father for our eternal salvation. After you believe in uh, the word of God, you must take on the Christian lifestyle. That's what Jesus is talking about, Luke 13, 3 and verse 5. Peter repeats in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where the King James Version of the Bible calls that repentance, which means that you must turn to God and live in righteously and abandon a sinful lifestyle. After you repent of your sins, you must show that you are not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God calls us to make our confession with our mouth that we believe Jesus Christ is our Lord, which means our, the Son of God. In Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10, you see an example of that in Acts 8, verse 37, when the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in order to be saved, you must also be baptized in the watery grave of baptism. There's many, many, many verses I can tell you that directly command us being baptized in water to be saved. I won't take up all your time in doing that. Uh, once it suffice. And Jesus has said in Mark 16, verse number 16, he says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And after you come out of the water grave of baptism, remember to continue in the Christian faith. That's what we've been talking about here today with great emphasis. That is, Jesus has said in Revelation 2, verse number 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Remember, faithfulness means loyalty. It means continue to prove yourself dependable by continuing to believe and obey Jesus to the end of your life, and heaven is going to be your home. If your Christian has fallen short, that is, you have done something that you regret, that you know has been wrong in God's sight, all hope is not lost. In fact, you still have hope. God has told us what to do when those situations arise in our lives, according to Acts 8, verse 22. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to verse number 10, there are three things that we must do in order to get back in favor with God. We have to repent of that sin, confess our fault to him, and ask him to forgive us. He will forgive us right then and there. So again, I want to bid you goodbye right now, for now. And hopefully to meet back up to you, with you, if the Lord wills, on next Wednesday, again, same time, same place, right here on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. May God bless you. May he keep you. Keep praying for us as we pray for you. Everyone have a good night and God bless you accordingly.